So we found this really fascinating. Put this up on the screen. These um, graphics of the way that the spending has changed from each of these parties in terms of what issues they are emphasizing. So um, the Democratic side, I think probably the most striking thing is that they have taken their foot off the gas on abortion ads. Now, they're still running some ads about abortion, but that has um, declined significantly now. It's 11.3 million with the Harris campaign and her allies. Um, Taxation is now the top spending item in terms of uh, ads from Kamala's team. And a lot of those are contrast, you know, claiming that Trump is going to raise working class taxes, especially the Trump tariff, that she's going to cut uh, working class taxes, that Trump wants to raise taxes on billionaires. On the Trump side, this was perhaps even more interesting to me. So he also has upped the spending on taxation um, ads, has decreased spending on crime and immigration quite significantly, and has also spiked the amount of spending on what they describe here as LGBTQ rights. These are ads attacking Kamala Harris over her support for various policies in favor of uh, transgender rights. So um, what do you make of, what can we say about how these two campaigns are analyzing the electorate and the voters who remain to be persuaded either into their camp or to turn out to vote? Yeah, I think on the Democrat side, you're seeing a shift in strategy on two fronts, right? One, they keep winning these elections while losing on the economy. Mm -hmm. This is more of a play for the economy to reduce Donald Trump's advantage. Um, And to say that, yeah, people might, it's actually kind of reminiscent of 2012. People thought Mitt Romney was better at handling the economy, but Mm. the question was who was going to fight for you. This is making the same argument that Donald Trump is out there for his billionaire allies and he's not going to cut taxes for you. Right. And so, you know, it's it's an argument that's worked before. Uh, I think the other side is that Donald Trump's favorabilities are a lot higher than they were the last two times. And if you looked at Harris's favorabilities, which are, you know, relatively favorable, unfavorable, relatively equal, which is impressive yeah. these days in politics, right. you'd think she was cruising for a blowout. Mm. But Trump's favorables are way better than they've been the last two times around. Yeah. They're, you know, they're negative, but they're not nearly as bad. Yep. I think this is, uh, you know, the notion, which I think was a fair assessment early on, was that like Trump was always going to be unpopular and do it to himself. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's not true. Maybe the Clinton and Biden attack ads worked better. And the character ads are trying to make that argument and bring them back down. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I was wondering about because i mean look i guess my bias on this leave i look at that i go oh hillary tried this you know biden tried this but uh when we talk about favorables how much of it do you think has to do with the ad spending and then how much of it is just like general uh awareness and thought about Mm -hmm. politics because from what I've looked at, a lot of the favorability data isn't just about character, but it transposes from people's feelings about the election. And they have a lot of nostalgia for the Trump time in office. And so that's what a lot of the favorability rating could come from. How much of it, I guess, is like people's just general perception? And then how much of this, does the advertising dollar really matter? Well, in the Senate and House yeah. governor races, boy, you can see that like, especially when you have a Democrat in a red area or a Republican uh-huh. in a blue area that starts out popular, those favorables start to get worse as the attack right. ads go up. Point. Yeah. yeah, Presidential, it's a little more stubborn. I yeah. also think Donald Trump, the stuff that drives people nuts, he's done it so much that it doesn't drive them as nuts about it, so that's helped him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're onto something there too. Uh, it does matter, there's a reason they do it, but mm-hmm. you know, presidential, the ads are going to mean less yeah, than it will sense. in other races because people consume just so much more information. Well, we have one of those ads uh, that Crystal was referencing. Uh, this, I saw this one when I was in Pennsylvania. This is all they play. It's like all day long. So let's take a listen. He murdered a father of three, sentenced to life in prison. Kamala Harris pushed to use tax dollars to pay for his sex change. I made sure that they changed the policy so that every transgender inmate would have access. It sounds insane because it is insane. Kamala was the first to help pay for a prisoner's sex change. The power that I had, I used it in a way that was about pushing for the movement, frankly, and the agenda. Kamala's agenda is they, them, not you. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that ad now. <laughs> just <laughs> having to watch like a Phillies game or something like that when I was in Pennsylvania. But I was like, okay, interesting. And it actually, from all of the data we see, that is going up. Uh, there was some differing data. It didn't really work all that well in 2022. So uh, do you think that this is an internal thing for the Trump people? Is it just clearly something that they are seeing resonating? What's the theory behind this? Uh, you know, this is yeah. a strategy that's as old as time or at least as old as democracy. Find the group that makes people a little bit uncomfortable frame them as the enemy. There's 0.1% of the population, so it's a little less cognizant in people's minds. You know, it's kind of similar to what President Bush did in 2004 when he ran on banning gay marriage. Uh-huh. Um, but here, that doesn't work as well anymore because now there's more people have come out. It's your neighbor across sure. the street, it's your grandson. 
0.1% of the population, there's enough that you're gonna be able to find a killer that you can frame as the face, but not enough that uh, people are gonna take it as personally. So yeah, the strategy can work. I don't think it's the most efficient strategy, hmm. um, but it is a strategy that there's a reason that comes in decade after decade after decade. You know, tell me what you think of this theory. Um, could we actually put back up on the screen that the graphics we had in A5 just to take a look again at the ad spending? Because, you know, Kamala's putting the bulk of her money into these like tax contrasts, like you said, like he's for the billionaires, I'm for you basically and using taxation as the frame. To me, that's a persuasion pitch. Like you said, that's trying to move people off of, you know, people who think Trump was great, maybe have issues with Trump already in his character, but are like, ah, I liked the economy better under Trump, you know, trying to push them towards Kamala Harris. The, the ad that we just played uh, attacking Kamala over transgender issues, that seems to me to be more of a turnout base pitch mm, of, you know, really trying to excite people who are already more or less favorable towards Trump, but maybe, you know, don't really feel like turning out on election day, which kind of makes sense given that they're relying on a lot of infrequent voters. Do you think that that's a fair analysis or do you think there's something else going on here in terms of very different pitches that are being made here in the closing days? Uh, I think that's probably true, although I also think people's opinions can be diverse on issues. There's going to be some people that have discomfort with trans people that also would be opposed to Trump's policy, past policies, at least yeah. on abortion. And that might be the selling point for them. Um, it also has uh, risks, though, because even when, you know, some voters might agree with Republicans on their stance about trans athletes, they also kind of, it comes across a bit as bullying sometimes, which can play yeah. into the character argument that Harris is making as well. So mm -hmm. they might win them on that issue, but it can also turn them off on the overall argument at the same yeah, time. You know, well. another thing that was really noteworthy from that uh, CNN analysis that we just had up on the screen, they also tracked the dollar amounts of which ads were purely negative, which were purely partisan, and which were the contrast. And this shows a very different approach as well. Republicans are almost totally negative. 80% um, went towards purely negative ads. Just over 20% was spent on contrast ads and literally nothing went toward just positive ads about Donald Trump. On the Democratic side, it was more of a mixture. You had out of about 95 million that Democratic advertisers were spending on broadcast TV for the first two weeks of the month. About 58% went towards contrast ads, 23% to negative ads, and about 19% to positive ads. So just on the, the negative to negative co um, comparison here, Republicans had 80% going towards negative, and Democrats had about 23% going towards negative. So even in that, you see a really stark difference in terms of how they're approaching these final days. And you know what I read into that is basically the Harris campaign is like, people already feel however they're going to feel about Donald Trump. Yes. You know, another ad about how like our children are watching or whatever <laughs> is not going to be. It's not going to. People have seen January's. They've seen all the things, right? So we need to build up Kamala a little bit. We need to do the contrast of the economic policies a little bit. Whereas the Trump campaign is looking at the fact that Kamala actually does have decent approval ratings. Like, we got to bring that down a little bit. We got to dirty her up. So um, what do you make of the difference between the, the negative and the positive approach? Yeah, I think you said this better than I can. I mean, it's all about- <laughs> Yeah, I got uh, it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both campaigns agree that people's opinions in Kamala are the most important part. And you know, as I was kind of saying earlier, I think there is a little bit of a shift from the Harris campaign yeah, right. to try to take that down a little. And a positive character ad about her, even if they don't even mention Trump, is a contrast ad of its own kind. That's a good point. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that is a really good point. Let's put uh, your forecast up on the screen, please. Uh, just want to go through it, some of the assumptions. So you still got uh, Harris at 52%. Talk to us a little bit about that. I, I mean, that's roughly in line. Nate Silver is at like 50 50. I think maybe I mean, like 54%. This is a coin toss. Yeah, this is. Uh, so, is it, so has nothing changed? Uh, what, you know, anything that you're looking at? Uh, if you're slightly uh, in favor of Harris, what's the case there? Is it just Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and strength amongst white voters? In, in Nevada. Okay. In Nevada, oh, Nevada. There's okay. Another option. Right. That looks good for Dems. I yeah. know the early vote day one wasn't, but the polls have been better there. Um, yeah, I would say, but the reason the race has gotten closer is we've seen a lot of polls, again, not top quality, but like medium, just an yeah. enormous amount that right. have been showing Michigan, Wisconsin getting a lot closer, mm -hmm. some of them showing them in the lead. Pennsylvania is actually, the polling is now stronger for Harris than those states, at least in my averages. Interesting. Uh -huh. So uh, that's kind of why it's getting closer is, yeah, Harris has a lead in 270 electoral votes right now, but Trump is a bit of a stronger lead in Georgia and Arizona. And uh, it, it doesn't take much for things to go wrong for him to yes. go win. Yeah. yeah that's um, such an interesting thing. Remind me from 2020, Joe Biden did the best out of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Was it Wisconsin he did the best, then Michigan, then Pennsylvania? Is that how it went? Um, it was Michigan was the best, yes. then Pennsylvania, then Wisconsin. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. No, yeah, Wisconsin, what, he only won by 10,000 votes, right? Or sorry, but yeah, Biden did, if I believe. If I, 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 I was just looking at these. Yeah, I shouldn't know this, but between uh, 2016 right. and 2020. Keep talking and I'll look at some <laughs> Yeah, all right. Wisconsin 2020 election results. Let's Do you take expect, though, those three states to kind of move in a similar direction? Is there any, because we've seen a lot of COVID era and post-COVID era uh, demographic shifts of people moving to Florida, people moving to Texas, you know, some of these, like we saw New York shift to the right, Florida shift to the right. Uh, have we seen any significant sort of demographic or political sentiment shifts in the post-COVID era in those three states? Um, sometimes midterms can be canaries in the coal mine for what's going to happen in the next presidential election, not always. Yeah. It's a really strong cycle for Dems in Pennsylvania and Michigan in a way that it, you know, Wisconsin was a lot closer. They lost uh -huh. the Senate race, barely won the governor race. Democrats so. also didn't invest in that Senate race, which was probably a mistake because it actually ended up being a lot closer than people thought it was going to yeah. be. Yeah, I think they'd be, they'd be the favorites right now to keep the Senate if they had won that race. That's in interesting. View. Okay, oh, so I I've got the data. That. So uh, it looks like Trump lost Wisconsin by about 20,000 votes. Lost PA by back of the napkin, roughly like 60, 70,000 votes. Glad you're votes. doing this math and not And me. then, uh, yeah, <laughs> don't fact check me, please. I'm, I'm doing mental arithmetic in my head. And then it looks like roughly 100,000 or so in Michigan. So, I mean, Wisconsin was pretty damn close. I'm, I'm kind of surprised about that. Wow, that's but, so funny. It's the opposite of what I remember. Yeah. I, 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 well, Wisconsin Pennsylvania was, was more, I mean, Pennsylvania just had all that mainline movement to Donald, I mean, sorry, to Joe Biden. I guess that's the real question here about Harris is like how much is she can't be able to hang on to that. Some of the, I mean, we are about to talk about McDonald's, but you can go out on that. Yeah, that was in Bucks County. That's one of those truly swinging counties in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, there was quite a bit of enthusiasm for him there. But then at the same time, the Harris campaign's like parked in Pennsylvania too. So they seem to think that all three will move in the similar direction uh, as opposed to Georgia and Arizona. So I guess what explains, you think, the difference between that? Is it that New York Times realignment theory about non-white voters? Uh, how should we look at that? If she does lose Georgia and Arizona, but does win the three blue wall states. Yeah, I think I yeah. think that would be it. I mean, yeah. the problem for Harris, right, is even if all three move together, that 1%, let's say, gap between them yeah, with bingo. elections razor right. tight could mean that one is just under and you lose. Mm. But mm. North Carolina is so close right now, at least in the polls. Yes. That becomes a viable replacement for Michigan or Wisconsin for Democrats. Mm. Good point. Yeah, very good point. Interesting. Uh, well, very it's interesting. Be fun. <laughs> all right. We'll see you next week, man. Thank you, Logan. Yeah, excited, yeah I really guys. appreciate yeah. it. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.